Hi, it's Israel here with another video. Today we're going to react to Subtractum interviewing Chris Wilson and Neon after XLCon. So make sure you check Subtractum out. Really excited to watch this video and we're, we're going to react hard. I'm uh, back home and chilling. Special treat today. I was hinting at it in the past couple of videos, but I finally have the footage. I am editing it right now. <laughs> and I'm very excited to show it to you guys. This is a very special interview with Chris and Mark. They felt really, really bad about how bad that mobile demo went, and oh, they wanted happened? to make it up to me and give me- What What happened with this mobile demo? Did it like crash or something? I didn't actually get to try mobile. Like I've been to XL cons now, still haven't actually had time to try PeeWee mobile. An opportunity to you know get something worthwhile stuttering. For traveling down right. to XLCon 4 Please, and uh yeah this was a very special treat for me i am honestly giddy to share it with you guys at midnight bex sent me a message hey how do you feel about coming to the office tomorrow and interviewing chris and mark and this was midnight and she said how about at noon tomorrow and obviously i said yes but also i was obviously very nervous and you'll notice that at the beginning of the video beginning of the interview i was uh, i was pretty nervous Beaks. so please give me a little bit of a slack there i had less than 12 hours to prepare you know including sleep in there as well i went to the office at about 11:30 kind of got oriented talked to them a little bit and then we just sat down and started talking so caveat with this interview this is not me trying to sit down and hit them with the hard hitting questions that everyone wants to know that you know, grilling them about, you know, why aren't there a Quicksilver Flask and stuff like that. This is me getting an opportunity uh, to sit down with the developers of one of my favorite games and just ask them questions. I, I took this opportunity a lot just to ask the questions that I care about. So if you're familiar with my approach to games and Path of Exile and what I care about, and you're curious about the stuff that I'm curious about, I think you're really going to enjoy the interview. I really love high level game design discussion and in a lot of like the deep lore questions. So I there's a the lot of that stuff. I also so cool. did not interrupt them whatsoever. I let them just talk when I asked a question. <coughs> I'm going to have timestamps below for individual questions that I asked. So whatever you might care about and what you don't care about, you can totally just like skip through them. For example, I asked Mark about, I think it was about defenses in the game. And he just went off about like hitboxes and everything. And that's a very long section of the video. And I just let him talk. Full caveats there. That's like just what you can expect. The other thing is, it was just three nerds in a room with no audio visual people to help us set anything up. So Chris took his uh, astrophotography camera and he set that up. It ran out of footage halfway through. Uh, luckily, we also put our phones on the couch and we were recording the audio there. Halfway through the interview, unfortunately, the camera ran out of footage. I have some stock PoE2 footage that I'm going to play. Am I but having... the second half of this is just a podcast. Thank you. So, you know, put on your headphones, walk around your house and listen, go for a jog or something. So, yeah, without further ado, that's what this is. Really enjoyed the interview. I can't thank those guys enough for taking the time out of their day. This was their day off, basically, the day after XLCon. Everyone was exhausted. And, you know, it was just basically us in the office. Like, almost no one else was there. They gave me the opportunity to just ask them some questions. I really loved it. Without further ado, enjoy. Hello, how's it going, everyone? Subtractum here with a post XLCon interview with Chris and Mark. And, uh, yeah, we're just going to talk about what happened in XLCon a little bit, get a little reflection there, talk about why we're here, and then... I'll try oh, to ask baby. some questions that you guys might be interested in that I get a special opportunity to ask them. So, yeah, Chris and Mark, how did the uh, the event go? God, that was a, a tiring but awesome weekend. Yeah, exhausted but happy. I think um, I signed every surface there was in that venue at the end. <laughs> yeah, where we were going to help us. Help us midnight? Midnight, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was yeah. Uh, yeah, you got locked in the building. Yeah. But, no, it was awesome. Very good yeah. to see everyone. Very good time. Yeah, looking forward so to cool to hang out with everyone. Mm -hmm. Awesome, yeah, I absolutely loved it, and uh, can't wait for the next one. Maybe perhaps we're not announcing <laughs> anything today. <laughs> totally understand that. Uh, so, yeah, did anything unexpected happen Maybe. at the con, or any special highlights that you guys want to mention? Well, Mark managed to die during the demo. That was a highlight. It wasn't unexpected. Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Rest it in was my unplanned, boss. Um, but no, no, it, it, the game hard. Yeah, it happened. Um, I have but, those. Yeah, it was interesting to see. There was actually, oh, a, you, you can see the shift in people's mentality before and after that, because before that, everything seems <laughs> planned. I knew there's a plan. And after that, it's like, oh, this is real. This is live. Like, they didn't mean for that to happen. And yeah, some people still didn't believe. They think it was intentional. I, I died on accident. But yes, yeah. it was real. Um, and it is a difficult game, which I'm sure everyone who played it. Yeah. We play we play uh, Path of Exile because Ray Class is a tough, unforgiving place. 
Excellent. And uh, yeah, anything no. else perhaps unexpected? Well, there was, of course, the mobile segment that you were involved in that um, was probably the worst technical hiccup we had. And yeah, it's one of those things where you check it beforehand and it works fine. And on the day, there's various technical issues, like when you have thousands of people on the Wi-Fi, it just ain't going to work how you expect. And yeah, that went terribly from a technical point of view. And so it kind of wrote it off. And we felt really bad about this because um, Subtractum traveled all the way over here to get some content to interview us. And we're just really not happy with how the mobile game was portrayed in the interview because of the massive, massive stuttering with gameplay. And so we thought it would be nice to invite him out to the office today when it's quiet here on the day after XHawkCon and get in a good discussion about whatever topics you want to talk about. Perfect. So talking about having a mobile game and Path of Exile 1 and 2, has there been any narrative challenges? Have you guys thought about the interplay and connection between those games? And I actually, the, my favorite part about playing the mobile uh, demo was being able to see some of the characters that we know and are familiar with in their younger forms and learning more about that. And that's actually what I wanted the most. And now that we might have three different time periods and locations in, oh, in the world of Rayclast. I know nothing uh, about mobile. Are there any current plans with that? Or <laughs> can well, you speak to that at all? An opportunity to talk about the past, the present, and the future. Mm. Path of Exile 2 explores what happens to Rayclast and the greater world after the events that you're currently seeing. Oh, cool. And Path of Exile 1 explores the backstory of what led the characters to be how they are. Mm -hmm. this is, it's going to be, I mean, we've got the call, the prequel, the... I do have a is what you'd call current timeline of POE 1 and, of course, the future timeline of POE 2. And it's good that there's enough time between each of those to make sure that we have... There is no Templar in POE 2. I don't want to say infinite, but pretty much an infinite amount of time to fill in with content patches for all of those games. And, yes, there's going to be a little bit of uh, making sure that every single expansion patch we do for POE 1, that it you know makes sense in the timeline of POE 2 going forward from that point. And same thing with mobile, making sure that it makes sense for POE 1. And so, yeah, it's a little bit of a you know, ripple in the water, so to speak, of, of things. But it, it, there's plenty of time there, and uh, I'm sure will come together pretty well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of ripple in the water, the you know one of the most controversial things is Path of Exile 1 and 2 being totally separate games right now. Um, in terms of philosophical approach and how you guys are going to be dealing with leagues and how you think about the games, uh, should we be thinking of them as just, I'm a Path of Exile 1 player, I'm a Path of Exile 2 player, I love both, or what kind of player am I and should, what should I be thinking, you know, going into having multiple games now? We definitely want people to play both if possible. If some people prefer one of the games, want to skip one of the leagues, depending on what it is, that's always fine. Path of Exile is a game you can pick up and come back to whenever you want to. I don't know if everyone's going to have time for that. The, while, like... I mean, obviously, when you watch the POE2 demo and we're taking care to explain the mechanics and combat stuff in a careful way and it feels a bit slow-paced, while the reality of people playing proper in-game characters is, of course, the speed and combinatorial complexity that we've come to love from Path of Exile, if there are aspects of either game that you prefer, it's a good opportunity to keep playing that one because we're supporting both of them as much as we can in the future. Awesome. From my perspective, I am... But I'm a player too. I, mm -hmm. I played the game before I got hired here. I still play the game every single league. And I am looking forward to playing both every single league for both of them. And I mean, hopefully that answers enough <laughs> of what I'm looking forward to do and what we're trying to achieve. So, Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that demo, that Huntress. That might be my new favorite class in all of Path of Exile. Sorry, Raider. But yeah. The Huntress felt real, real good. More of that. That's that's all I'm asking for. Nice. Um, now, speaking of the split, uh, in terms of one of the other fears is resource allocation between Path of Exile 1 and Path of Exile 2. Is that something that you guys want to comment on right now? I think that Path of Thank Exile you. 1 will see even more resources allocated to it as Path of Exile 2 nears completion, and there's a few reasons for that. The first one is, when we were working for the last few years, the quiet period where we weren't talking about Path of Exile 2, we had probably over-allocated art resources to Path of Exile 1 in particular. Most of our team is artists. The vast majority of people working for us are artists, as is the nature of AAA game development. And we were producing leagues where... No longer indie game. No longer small indie game developer. He said it. AAA development. They did it. Um, hey, Sephiroth. But that's honestly like I felt like splitting me in was such a mistake until I realized how few people worked at POE1. No, it doesn't seem to be a set number. 
which I think they uh, address in this video too. But um, the fact that, you know, sometimes there's only five people working on PoE 1, sometimes there's 10, whatever, and there's going to be more after the split, so. Every single piece of content was, to some extent, unnecessarily hey, new Shelf, because Path of Exile has such a vast library of assets that we can fall back on. And this was slowing down development of Path of Exile 2 quite a lot. It was taking a lot longer than we expected. And so we realized that we needed to make sure most of the artists were working on Path of Exile 2. <laughs> and we had the Path of Exile 1 team with a small team of artists primarily consisting of designers and programmers able to reuse all the stuff we've made and um, and make sure we're coming up with new mechanics that used our existing art in interesting ways. And you'll notice when you look at leagues over the last couple of years, they've been a bit less art intensive than ones like, say, Heist or Betrayal that involved dozens of characters and crazy new tile sets and so on. And so the environment art team and the monster creation team and so on have been hard at work on Path of Exile 2. <sighs> But that pipeline is going to eventually run out of work to do as the game gets completed. Like, for example, with concept art, where they work out, especially environmental concept art, where they're sketching new areas. I mean, we know what the new areas are for the six acts of Path of Exile 2. At some point, they're going to run out of new areas to work on, in which case they're available for either future Path of Exile 2 expansions or Path of Exile 1 expansions. And so as the teams of Path of Exile 2 gradually get taken off the major production mode they're <laughs> in at the moment, it's going to free them up to be working on both games. And so we'll probably be seeing quite meaningful Path of Exile 1 expansions that continue to grow, especially once the Path of Exile 1 team, it's not that they're going to be competitive with the Path of Exile 2 team, but they certainly want to pull in good player numbers. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be quite a drive to try to, you know, gently one-up the other game in terms of the amount of awesomeness that we can actually deliver. So we're expecting to see some good stuff. And I'm sure Mark has a unique perspective from the PoE 2 point of view as well. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of developers working on both. Um myself like sure i'm not inputting the data for the monsters or anything but i am certainly deciding what they are what they do and for both contexts um and from the art perspective like looking at from just say monsters um and I, I mentioned this at the convention as well at, at one point but something like sanctum uh the bosses in sanctum were taken from poe2 resources <laughs> like those are like lycia was a monster that was made for poe2 a boss that oh, uh, that's cool. hadn't found a home in PoE 2 either yet or uh, as of this current or as of when it was ported and so we were like well let's use it in PoE 1 and so even then even though you've got all these artists working on PoE 2 a lot of them are kind of indirectly working on PoE 1 because we're using a lot of those assets and in, in PoE 1 as well and we've been doing this for a very very long time mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to say, you know, how many people are working on this versus that when we're doing that kind of reuse all over the place. Because in the end of the day, like what you end up having is everyone's working on POE 1 and everyone's working mm. on POE 2 at the same time. It's also worth noting with content reuse, it may seem like a bit of a dirty thing to, you know, intentionally take something and dress it up as something else in the game. It seems lazy or cheap to do so, but it's actually kind of the fabric of how we approach the company. Like back when... Um, I started it with Jonathan and Eric a long time ago. We realized that with the limited amount of funds we had. Of I don't know how many people actually think that, like, if you can reuse something in a good and meaningful way, that seems like just like a good thing. It never, it doesn't, I don't know, it, at least maybe, maybe I'm insane here, but it's like never something that seemed like cheap or stupid. It seems like what you should do. Available. We're trying to make a game for 20 times less budget than other studios would. We had to go deep on the content reuse. We had to make sure every asset could be used in as many different ways as possible, like color reskins and resized shapes and chop stuff around and make sure that we could reuse it as much as we could. And this is important as well for action RPGs, where it's all about procedural generation of areas and random monster mods and getting to fight the same thing in 50 different ways and different combinations of leagues and different combinations of mods on it and ways that you're playing and so on. And that means that we have a pipeline set up to be able to make one thing and use it in 20 different ways. And that lets us leverage stuff between the two games um, really well. And so we're internally using POE2 stuff all over the place in POE1 in more subtle ways than Mark's even mentioned here. I mean, the GDC talk, uh, Path of Exile, designed to play forever. Mm. I, I recommend that all the time. So <laughs> very familiar with that. Yeah, speaking of Sanctum, regarding that coming back, the number one question on everyone's mind Original Sin, Winds of Fate, Sandstorm Visage. Can you comment on the uniques yet, or...? Um, are we bringing those ones back? I believe our current intention is to keep them as they were. Like, yeah. We have no intention to change them. My understanding, last I Attractive. checked, is that all of the unique relics, there? at least the rewards, still exist in some form and let you get the same uniques. 
I haven't double checked the list myself, but I don't know of any plans to drop any of them. Some of the unique relics had to be rebalanced to make sure the um, you know criteria worked properly, but the intention is the rewards are still available. Excellent. I do know uh, Andrew was our main uh, game designer on that one, and um, he certainly has a list of things to check with me mm-hmm. just to make sure we're going to go over but of course the, the big lead up to Exalcon we were we had one of a single mind or I was more so of just trying to get all the demos ready and everything prepared for that so mm. if it's in the list of his things to go over well then I don't know about it yet either and so you know as much as I do but uh, up until here enough we've with no plans to change any of those uniques. Yeah, it's certainly our goal to have a wide variety of powerful uniques because Sanctum itself is a valuable thing to find and a valuable thing to run and hard to get through th- um, four floors of it and hard to kill Lysir in both forms. <laughs> Something, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but did anyone notice how much damage they were taking in Sanctum in the actual video? I feel like the entire like softcore mechanic is gone. Like, I think... Now that they've done that, your actual defenses matter. You can definitely die in Sanctum now. None of this, like, oh, you failed the run and you get kicked out. It kind of looked like they basically removed the medium core aspect. Honestly, I was initially very, very anti. Like, you know, you're hardcore. You should die and lose your character. But I actually think for the way PoE's content cycle is, with how often they pump out content, I think it's so beneficial to them that the lead content is medium core. Um, and they don't lose your characters during it because then it's less, less shit when it's badly balanced. No, not yet, Saffron. So I actually really like the medium core aspects for leagues and then you can have like bosses and stuff. Be like killers. And therefore getting an appropriately powerful reward is good. And if we were to determine that one of these was too powerful, well, we can just make it harder to get. Make Sanctum's harder to get, whatever we need to do. But I'd rather something was... I'd rather that a powerful thing existed though. in the game as very rare, rather than being removed entirely. Which is why Headhunter still exists. <laughs> and we've been wearing the shirt. <laughs> Despite all my attempts to change it in the past. <laughs> um, and actually speaking of Sanctum and how it's set up, one of the coolest things that I saw this weekend is that you guys are bringing in some tweaks to Sanctum for defenses actually applying to the resolve mm. loss. And yeah. I thought that was a beautiful, elegant solution to like one of the biggest complaints during Sanctum League was that the meta build, which it has been for a while, thanks Pox, is Righteous Fire, and especially Righteous Fire Juggernaut. And, you know, uh, low DPS, high defense, had a little complaint with that. And this sounds like it's a, a great addressing of that. Um, now for 322, uh, looking at their strategic setup of all of that, very, very excited for it, but I'm a little concerned for us kind of outscaling that. And I don't get the argument for new content to not kill hardcore player. Isn't that what you sign up for when you go hardcore? Um, it's just the fact that it's like very often so badly balanced that it doesn't, it's like, there's been so many leagues, like Metamorph, et cetera, where things have needed to be nerfed, like, nine or ten times. That there's no, like, there's no, like, there's several things, right? Uh, the the craziest, the craziest example I have was when the Cyrus influenced monsters were put in the game. The, the only thing you could do was not to do tier 14 maps or above, right? I actually didn't die to them because I saw somebody else die to them and I was like, okay, I need to wait a week and a half to actually play with it, right? And that's not... But how much of the balance problem is just being new, unfamiliar content versus actually being on melons? All of it. That's why. <laughs> like, the, the, there's been so many things, everything that almost needs like between five to ten nerfs before it's actually balanced, Right. You see so many unbalanced content, and then in a month, people stop moaning because they've nerfed it five to ten times. Yep. Not because people get used to it. Like, obviously, I'm not talking about something just being new, and then you have to get used to something. I'm talking about the entire design being, like, bad. That's what I mean. <clears throat> and, um, you know, certain specialized bills just being way out of whack um and just like the way that you guys did it with sanctum and now with the re the rehash of sanctum uh can you speak to the strategic element and how you're kind of balancing player power versus you know using that strategy there 
Well, we're okay with people working out what builds work best in Sanctum because it's itemized and you can trade four Sanctums. If you can specialize and just get a pile of Sanctums and run them profitably, that is a way to play Path of Exile. Now, of course, if the build is deemed to be too powerful, we will probably eventually adjust it. You know, we don't want to make sure it's balanced and fair, but absolutely there will be a good way to build characters and a bad way to build characters, which is the same for any of the content in the game. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting as well that we've... um, when we've been rebalancing Sanctum, we've taken an opportunity to change monster diversity, so you'll be facing a wider variety of threats within the area, so it's a bit less predictable. And this does mean you do have to be a bit of a jack of all trades with regard to the types of monster mods and so on you're encountering. Okay. I certainly found Sanctum to be, at its core, amazing. I love Sanctum. But the monster diversity was probably my personal problem I had when playing it on the Live Realm. Just the but too much repetition for my liking. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, we have so many monsters in the game, there's no reason we need to be... And we're talking about reuse of art assets and all mm-hmm. of that. There's no reason we can't be making more of them. So And players love Dutch Nemesis, so... I don't know. What that, right, I, don't well, know I don't know what that word is. I don't know if we're going there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, speaking of different archetypes and you know dealing with different content, one of the things I was most impressed with in Poe Two was the approach to melee and especially building in mobility with a lot of the melee. And it actually felt really, really good. Like for one of the first times in Path of Exile in a while. I mean, besides Bone Shatter, um, like all of the melee that I used between the Huntress and the Warrior all of the moves felt really mm. cool because it, it felt like it solved the issue of standing still. And is there any plan in kind of, you know, getting some of that back into Path of Exile 1 and, and kind of, you know, make melee great? We want Path of Exile 1 melee to feel as good as we can. Mm-hmm. And this is tricky because in order to do the Path of Exile 2 thing, we generally need a lot of the Path of Exile 2 um, animations and rigs that come with the new character classes. We are... We would desperately love to make sure that as much of this was in Path of Exile 1 as possible. It's just quite a large task to do so, because in order to get all of the skills in Path of Exile 1 to use them, it basically means redoing them all. And we are selectively doing this for some Path of Exile 2 stuff that is from Path of Exile 1. And so we're trying to quantify what work would be involved in improving Path of Exile 1 melee in the same way. And, you know, you can put a dollar value on everything and the dollar value may be large and we just have to work out from a resource allocation and a time point of view when and how that's happening. And I understand that, um, especially after the announcements at Exocon, players are wanting to know exactly what is the plan for the stuff in Path of Exile 1, like pledge to us when each thing is going to be fixed and how. And we understand that that's something that they're wanting to hear. And so we have to work out what's plausible, what's plausible in the short term, what's plausible in the medium term. I um, wonder what we Even get if from we were term. able to get to do the very large amount of work to get that stuff into Path of Exile 1, it can't be done before Path of Exile 2 is released. And so there's some things that are long term. And we, in the meantime, would like to make meaningful improvements as much as we can to Melee. And there's things we've just learned to make it better that we haven't yet applied to POE 1 that we can potentially apply. And yeah, there's there's a lot of scope for improvement there. Like we are, the experiment of making melee as good as it can be in Path of Exile 2 has now made us experts in doing this. So we mm-hmm. can apply this to Path of Exile 1. They do share a very large amount of the code base and so on still. And Mark very likely has a more accurate understanding of this. Well, it's certainly, yes. I mean, as Chris said, there's a dollar value on everything, but resources are finite, right? I mean, you're talking about Respond large that. amounts of, we'd have to change every skill or a large amount of them, we would have to then re- uh, do the same with the effects, the character animations, um, but also the balance ties in with a lot of what goes on there. Like those skills uh, moving at, you know, the way that they move, uh, is it going to hold up in the kind of period one, um, especially when things like travel skills come into play? I mean, a lot of those are teleports and all of that. It feels very, uh, responsive I guess whereas like a lot of the more movements are in POE2 are a lot more subtle and flowy and they have a good flow to them but they're not they're very not start stop start stop start stop Mm -hmm. which is a lot of what POE1 is um so will that hold up where now we have some stuff ported over or or re-implemented re-added and some of it's flowy and some of it's start stop maybe it might be fine but either way it's a lot of character animating a lot of rigging um uh, because you'd be talking about if we were to take the new characters, put them into POE 1, where you have to re-rig every single armor to them. 
And that's all well and good. It's easy to say, well, just do it. But like now those people aren't making new content. Yeah, there's not much adding stuff to the game. And so Yeah, one of the things I asked the animators about particularly was like how's he gonna work with like and how much work was it to get the rolling, right? Like, because you're, if you're swinging and then start rolling, but apparently that just like, that just worked. Well, then there's a, well, hire more people. Well, I mean, easier said than done. Um, very easy said than done, um, okay. especially the right people. Jobs at grindinggear.com, please apply yes. if you're a world-class animator. <laughs> I mean, we've got a custom engine. These people have to be trained on our engine in order to do that um, and these things. Um, Nice and product. that balloons out into just a massive, massive resourcing task. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult to know whether or not it can be done, how it should be done. Yeah, yeah. And the logistics behind it all is just very, very complex. So, But we're going to discuss, see what we can do, because we certainly want that to be the case. It's just a matter of getting all the pieces in the right place at the right time. I can see you guys have thought about Melee a lot. <laughs> it, it is a very large, very large desire of us to make it perfect. We... We have felt inadequate for Melee for a number of years. Mm. You know, when other games have also Melee, we feel embarrassed and we want to be best in class. Like, we want to, they're playing catch-up. Like, we, we like it when other people are playing catch-up catch up with us. And so that's the situation we want to be in. And then we'll try to reflect as much of that in POE 1 as we can. Admirable. Awesome. Uh, speaking of a similar thing that's related to Melee, I guess, uh, the current state of defense, actually, it's been kind of a roller coaster defense. over the past couple of years. But I would... For myself personally, defense actually feels in a really cool place. Like we have so many different options between fourth vow, blood notch, doppelgangers. There's so many cool options to become very tanky across basically every sentence in the game. Um, are you guys really happy with where defense is right now? Uh, it, you know, it's obviously always a continual conversation. Things are changing, and is that influencing? The way that you're thinking about defense and i've heard some things i don't know i don't want to like lead the question here but i've heard some things about defense and poe2 as well being very different uh the approach to it and the plan there and uh you know what's the interplay between you know poe1 and 2 and how you guys are thinking about defense right now um i would say in poe1 i'm i'm pretty happy with it again there's always the the small things and um you know there's the whole you know, everyone running grace determination kind of situations and all of that. And you could, you could argue one way or the other, whether or not these are good things or bad things. Um, you know, I'm sure there's, I think I preferred when potions were stronger. Like that was my favorite part of defense in PoE, where I felt like you had a large amount of choices for bosses in defense. You could do like Zibakwa, you could do really high effective HP, you could do like loads of things. And then for mapping, your mapping defenses were basically like Quicksilver, Quartz, and I run it, and, and that was fine for tier 16 mapping. I actually really liked that because then you had like so many different choices. And you didn't need like three defensive auras. These things will be continue to be balanced. As for um, here we two and how they differ. Um, I wouldn't say they're fundamentally different. Um, you know, you still have the, the three core defenses. Um, you still have life. There is one thing which I will note. We have, we told some people, but there is no life on the tree in POE2. Okay. And I know that's not a de, you know defense, but it is your effective life pool. Right, it's life on the tree in peel the three core defenses. Um, you still have life. There is one thing which I will note. We have we told some people, but there is no life on the tree in POE two. Okay, and. I know that's not a de, you know defense, but it is your effective life pool. That's right? wild. It's your life pool, not your effective life pool. It is your life pool. Um, and uh, this means investing in the in the alternate. You instead of now having this whole kind of I need to get one hundred and fifty percent increased life, two hundred percent increased life. You have this kind of like minimum standard you need to hit. You now are, are investing even more passives into these really interesting uh, other defensive mechanics. You know whatever they are. Or, you know, they are. I mean, there's obviously the armor, the evasion, energy shield, suppression, and all that, and. We are going to try and make sure there are a lot more interesting. How's that going to work with ES? He did say that it's still ES. Like, 
Yeah, it's going to be insane then. Situational and conditional defenses for different situations that you're investing in. Because it's just more fun to do that. Um, life is life. <laughs> and if we just assume that everyone's life is what it is, you get it from level, you get it from gear, and you kind of have this just upward trend of life going through the game, and you balance monster damage corresponding to that, plus all the defensive axes, then um, you've just now made the passive tree just far more interesting mm. because you're not just going, well, 5% life, 5% life, 5% life, 5% life. Um, you now have a lot more going on and you could be like, okay, I want to get some of this defense and then now I'm going to get this thing and this thing. It just yeah, broadens up the choices a lot. This is an interesting one because when I first heard about it, I really strongly disliked it. You know, to the point where I call a meeting of, hey guys, I don't really care what the reasoning is, we're going to undo this. And then I heard the reasoning and had a play with the tree. And I'm fully convinced now that when you're not just saying, how do I get every life node on the tree? And you're actually saying, what character build do I want to be? I'll get my life from items. And then the game is balanced around that. It's like mm -hmm. twice as good. But don't worry, we're not going to strip life from the passive tree in Path of Exile 1. <laughs> Um, and of course there are new... Honestly, this is why I changed my mind. Sorry. So when, like I said earlier, when I first heard they were splitting the game, I was like, oh my fucking God. Now I'm like, thank fuck that they are splitting the game. Because worst case scenario, let's say that, like, let's say worst case scenario, right? Let's say PoE2 is dog shit. Right? That is the worst case scenario, that it's just straight up bad. At least we still have PoE1. Like, at the end of the day, like... It's so good. I'm so happy we have both. Because you that like, you'd never know, right? Just because something is newer, like uh, the best example is old school RuneScape versus RuneScape three, right? Like old school RuneScape is so much better than RuneScape three. I was actually playing quite a lot of RuneScape while in New Zealand. I got my black mask finally, and I'm like, I'm like, I went from fifty two Slayer. I think I'm like sixty five now or something. I don't even know. Uh, what if they delete Pee-wee on my accident? But yeah, I mean, I, I love that they're letting the game. Honestly, it's so... I'm like biased as a content creator because it's such a good safety net for me. Men's love vacation again, RuneScape levels. Dude, I love RuneScape. Defensive mechanics. I mean, no, like I don't the know obvious one being dodge roll. It is a active <laughs> defense, I guess you could call it. Um, and you can invest into it, you can spec into it, you can make it better. Um, and that is like one example of new ways you can do that. Um, it works so well with the grand animation cancelling stuff as well. Oh yeah. I'll tell you, that's a tricky one. So uh, you get into the muscle memory of space barring. Then you go play POE1 and oh, yeah. running is playing yeah. and you're like, oh, that's right. Space <laughs> bar doesn't do anything. Oh, it closes UI. <laughs> um, you got to. You really got to get into these two my, yeah. uh, states of mind for that one. The first half an hour of playing POE two recently was pressing spacebar to close the overlay map or whatever, and yeah. instead rolling. It, it happens for other games as well, where like you, I go, you go from this top down WASD movement games, and then you go into a, you know Path of Exile, and they, ah, that's right, that's not how that works. Um, so it's just you get into muscle memory and habit from playing different games, and then you. Do it. And it's the same thing here when you're jumping back and forth between these, especially with that space bar. And I love to just, I wonder, I don't know why, I just find myself uh, logging in, running around town, just spamming space bar everywhere I'm running. Just <laughs> that in every game? On. It feels faster than running, but it's exactly the same speed. Exactly right? same. Yeah, I actually took my phone out and I timed it. Yeah. I, I walked yeah. between one area and then I, I dodge rolled between one area and I was like, oh, it really is the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it felt really good. There was, I don't remember which boss it was. It was always the Huntress because I just I absolutely fell in love with her. But there was one boss that do it felt like the boss was designed, how do we make dodge roll feel the best mm. in, in the entire encounter? And just like every move was just telegraphed. Sorry, I'm just gushing about it. But yeah, like every move was just perfectly telegraphed. And I, I, I know people hate this comparison sometimes, but I'm a huge Dark Souls fan. And it yeah, felt like it rewarded me for starting to really learn those patterns, dodge all of them. And then it, I had really huge opportunities for applying name, applying puncture, and just everything just lined up so perfectly. So yeah, that just I, I like the dodge roll you a lot. You would possibly be surprised about how much of that just comes together without even trying. Hmm. Like we don't even look at it and go, like we do all the animations, we do the fight, we put it all together, and then we do it while dodge rolling. But we didn't, we didn't go like, here's how long the animation needs to be, and here's how long the telegraph needs to be because of dodge roll. 
um, it often, like I'd say there's like an 80% of the time, we just do it to what we feel right without any consideration for dodge roll. And then it happens to be, it just works perfectly, which is kind of cool. It just means that it just, it's just one of those kind of subtle wins that just happen to just come by without, you know, but then there are cases obviously where uh, it does. We uh, have time to, so uh, an example, I guess um, one of the, I don't know if you fought the pirate boss in act four at all. No, I did not get very far in that yeah, form. He summons a big anchor from the... Okay. So it renders a, uh, a kind of ghost, flamey looking circle, and then a big anchor comes down, smashes down. That one specifically, we had... Hello, I need to stop trying to dodge roll in PoE 1 after playing a PoE 2 league. I mean, it'll just be like... It'll be like you're using your remembered ability, right? Like, space bar is already either my flame dash or my shield charge. I get... So uh, for me, that's not going to be a big issue. Like it'll be like a thirty-minute thing. But yeah, uh, we'll see. It'll be fine. Times with dodge roll in mind. Um, <clears throat> trying to think if there were any others. Many Friday other for uh, obvious ones. There were not coming to mind immediately, but um, yeah, some are. I mean, a lot of them <laughs> melee and monsters swinging and doing stuff like that. It's uh, Friday. It just comes together quite naturally. I love the way you can dodge roll between the legs of some monsters. Oh yeah, that's fun. That is fun. I, I, I spoke that, about that in my boss talk, but the, um, in POE 1, everything has a central hitbox. Mm -hmm. um, so everything's a big cube, right? Yeah, everything's just a square. Um, and our grid is a square. The whole world of ground is just a square grid, right? That's how it all works. And um, um, mostly for pathfinding, we cannot have things larger than a certain size. So object size five, we call it. And um, projectiles have the same thing. An ob a projectile cannot be larger than object size five. Um, these are technical and I believe mostly performance limitations. And uh, But then you said, like, oh, how does Katava work? That's, That's exactly what I was just going to ask. It <laughs> doesn't move. So they're allowed to be big if they cannot pathfind. Oh, OK. And he, he, he animates, but he never moves off the spot. Um, Arakali is the same. She recedes down and then teleports and comes back up, but she never part finds. Now her death animation moves to the center, but it's animated to move to the center. There's no actual part finding going on. Ah. And um, we added the concept of sub objects, server side sub objects, I should say. Yeah. And um, so we added the concept of server side sub objects. And uh, what we can do is effectively have, they can turn on and off. So for example, <laughs> I can, um, if just simulating Katava a little bit when he buries his hand on the ground, we can then turn on the sub-object, sub and now you can damage it. And then when he brings his arm back up, it's no longer there, can't be damaged. This is not something we had before. But yes, it means that objects uh, ah. don't need to have central hat boxes because we can just turn that off, and instead the, both their legs can no, be whatever off. limbs. There's, there's some, some monsters have like 50 different limbs, so it's hard to name what they are. but. Uh, ultimately, yes, you can hit different parts of the bosses or different parts of the monsters, and it means you can dodge roll through things. And we're trying to make the physics feel a lot more realistic. Like things have collision when they should and don't have collision when they shouldn't. Um, whereas, like, yes, a lot in, in POE 1, for example, you have, uh, we, we struggle with quadrupeds. And um, so you have, like, the, you know, just the, the beast monsters, the bears, the ones in the hat 2. Um, they're quite long, but the object size is quite small because it can't be larger than five. I mean, they're a rectangle, if you were to look at it, or an oval, if you want to look at it from like a top-down perspective. Um, but and then we have to make them a square. And so what you will find, and it's hard to notice uh, a lot of the time, is that if you then went up to melee it, you'd actually, you'd intersect with it quite far, um, especially on its front and back. Mm -hmm. But on the sides, it'd probably be about right. So um, this... Now that we have a lot more close range, intimate melee going on in POE 2, yeah, where you actually facing. are in their face doing, you know, like armor break is a good example. Yeah, you step forward into it. We don't want you to like step forward and then you're just like intersecting with the monster, um, trying to hit its center. So for larger monsters, we give them different. Every single small hit, it's the player in the, uh, stuns the player in these gameplay demos. So that'll be a huge criticism. Oh, absolutely. It felt awful in Act 3. Act 2 felt quite good. But Act 3 felt miserable. I did not enjoy playing Act 3. Um, 
for those that have seen my video, like I was just like permastone by small things and I was like, oh my god, this feels awful. So that's something I hope changes. Might have to do with gear. Yeah. Sub objects at different positions with different sizes and it just all makes it feel a lot more like there's a lot more collision, a lot more physics and you know it it, it makes it just feel a lot more realistic. Uh, in, a, in a good way and that's more, <coughs> more visceral i guess is another way um the other thing we have which i hadn't actually spoken about as as well as this thing called pushy mode okay an interesting uh name but um what happens now is if you have a this is all all kind of tangential to melee but it is what makes it feel very uh grounded is this pushy mode concept is a monster can have it we give them a size and we or a pushy size and it's kind of like i guess their momentum their mass it kind of takes all that into account and um and if they kind of uh if they were to increase velocity we could increase their pushy size um because they would like a big monster before you'd have a small monster and you'd have a big monster just pathfinding into it even if it was faster so let's say you had a um I don't know, I'm trying to think of good examples in PW1, but you'd have a swarm of little monsters chasing you and you just have a bunch of bigger monsters like, I want to get by and I can't. And like, they're not going to pathfind all the way around the pack. They're just, everything's trying to get to you. Or they are constantly all trying to pathfind, but they'll just be getting blocked. Mm -hmm. Now that big monster is just going to be like, get out of the way. And they all just get <laughs> pushed to the side. Um, the first area in Act 2 does do that. There's the bigger maggot zombies and then the smaller ones, the one in the Huntress demo. Mm -hmm. And those big ones just trample over the other ones and push them all to the side. They were just, they're going to get to you. Um, I think the hyenas probably do. I was going well, to mention the hyenas, yeah. Yep. Um, and because of this, we're applying the size to everything. Uh, when something is charging, we increase the size. And then when they stop, we decrease the size. So when they're charging, they have more momentum. They'll be more likely to push stuff out of the way. Um, and of course, this applies to even you and tiny monsters. So, uh, with, for example, dodge roll, like if there is a smaller monster and you roll, you're not going to get stuck on that. Let's say you're completely surrounded. You cannot pathfind out. Dodge roll does pathfind. Um, interestingly, it didn't in the keynote because, uh, we didn't have that update in because we were working on a stable build. Mm, right. In fact. So that point where Jonathan... Excuse Kowitz, me why you might have died, maybe? No, <laughs> not at all unrelated. But that one point where Jonathan's like, we've even made it so you don't get stuck on things. And I dodge roll and immediately got stuck on something. Not a, not a current problem. <laughs> um, it was funny, though. Um, so, yeah, when you're dodge rolling, we can have it that you're like, well, you're increased in momentum temporarily, right? So if you're surrounded by small monsters, it'll push them out of the way and you're fine. If you're surrounded by large monsters, you're not going to be able to move them. Um, mm. But yes, it applies to it applies to monsters as well, where they get different levels yeah, of stuff. pushy and yeah, move things out. out of the way. And it, it creates this kind of cool thing where, um, again, it all just feels a little bit more realistic. You don't just have these big mobs just going like, oh, I can't move because there's a tiny little bug in front of me. And... Um, the way we've solved this a lot in the past is by giving things phasing and it just makes everything feel so like ephemeral and you know, it's just artificial and it's not great. Mm. So this whole pushy system is kind of cool. And I mean, I do like it. I do like and, phasing. Um, even different player skills will have different pushy values like uh, the whirling charge on the monk, the whirling assault. Um, I can't remember if that's the final name we went with. Uh, has increased pushy during that. So you're pushing stuff out of the way as you're doing it. But if you were to like try and push like crew tog that giant at the end of one of those goblin arenas, oh, obviously that's not going to happen. Knock back, different mechanic entirely. These pushy, knock back, separate. Anyway, bit of a rant. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's defense and path of exile too. Yeah. <laughs> that's the question. No, it's great. I'm, I'm hit me with everything. Uh, so yeah, I was going to go with the flip side of that. Uh, currently, offense and path of exile one. We scale pretty crazy right now. Uh, I have a Mage Blood Tornado Shot character with the Crucible Trees and all of that. How do you guys currently feel about offense in Path of Exile 1? You know, similar question, scaling in the Path of Exile 2. Also regarding like borrowed power between the leagues, looking at all that, like we had Sanctified Relics and then we have the Crucible Trees. And yeah, when we have those things, they feel really, really mm -hmm. good. And, you know, I think people get a little bit of you know, they get that FOMO or they just get, they, they feel that, okay, this impending loss, but kind of knowing, at least for me, the confidence that 
I've been feeling pretty good league after league for a while now. It feels pretty good. Is is do we anticipate this as kind of a pattern? Do you feel like this okay, pattern question. and the systems that you have in place right now are kind of heading off any sort of like three fifteen event and like feel like our current power and, and that scaling is, is in a good place right now? In the past, our philosophy was try to make stuff core as much as possible, pile the game full of content because a bigger game is better, and it's because people liked systems, we leave them in generally, right? You know, you you get to keep talismans, you get to just have those forever, and any stuff we release in a... What an example to pull! <gasps> people love talisman. Oh my god, I love that that was the example he went with out of any league. You know, that's that's the first <laughs> of the expansions that started to have its own unique reward arc, which is why I use it as the first example. I understand the power level of talismans is very low <laughs> by current levels, but basically every one of the things that we had would, you know, like catalysts and, you know, um, anointments and that kind of stuff would just all get piled into the game and you get more and more of these. And that's good, but they all add a small amount of um, incremental power gain compared to the previous league. They let you juice your mods up slightly more, they let you do a bit more damage, they let you progress a bit more quickly. And it got to the point with you know, the 315 situation where we, you know, looked at the power creep and said, we need to do something about hitting off some of this. And that was received poorly because, you know, people don't like to lose something they have. Fair mm -hmm. enough. And we've heard that. And so we've been making a bit more of an intentional decision. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm a big fan of borrowed power personally. I, I think is it MMO communities are very against borrowed power, like WoW and stuff. But I think borrowed power is really good because you address the power creep concern and you feel good, but in a different and new, interesting way each time. Uh, so I think for ARPGs, it's perfect. I think that's what they should do. Um, I would say, I mean, you're just going to have power creep. You're going to have power creep. With ARPGs, you can introduce new things that counter power creep. But... I feel like every, I don't know what the number is, but I feel like every four to eight patches, you need a nerf patch. Like 315 needs to happen now and again. I, I really think it does need to happen. If, well, I mean, if you want to play a game for more than four years, like you do need a, a, a power creep patch. In my opinion. I mean, it never feels good. Recently, but to it is be needed. conscious of what power creep we <laughs> cumulatively merge into the base game. And so, as with Sanctified Relics and Crucible... Borrowed power is, for example, in Crucible, we've got the skill trees on the weapons, right? And we're losing that now, and now we're getting new things in the Totem of the Ancestors League. And, like, it's power that you only have for one patch. Thor sitting there with the 28 months. Yeah, tattoos. Yeah, but not in a way that makes it worse to play now weaker. trees um you can have them for the league and we may find a way to bring them back later but we don't want to just stack them all up on top of each other otherwise the issue with path of x are both becoming somewhat complicated and unapproachable and literally melting server hardware now i shouldn't say literally that's not true <laughs> i have seen fire <laughs> okay um Anyway, that um, starts oh. to become a problem. And that's why we're being careful to swap things out. Having said that, you know, there's still continued power gain in Path of Exile, one happening league by league. And we do try to make things core. We're just careful. There's certain things like recombinators where if we just frivolously made them core, then it would be of a similar impact to when we um, brought Harvest Core without due consideration for the consequences. I am, I certainly am a huge fan of people. I love recombinators. It's by far the best thing they've ever added in the game. It's so much better than Harvest. Like, it's just so good. Like, Harvest was so bad. Like, Harvest is now in a good spot. But yeah, full-powered Harvest that we got in Mitchell was, like, the worst thing. Because it just, it detracted from the rest of the game. I think, I don't know, I feel like they don't, like, talk about that enough. Because the reason why Harvest was bad was it was detrimental to everything else, right? It didn't add anything. Like, Harvest didn't add anything to, like, Delve. It didn't add anything to Incursion. It didn't add anything. Like, it removed other ways of gearing. It removed other ways of crafting. And it just became, like, finish an item. Here you go. Whereas with, with uh, Recombinators, everything was exciting. You could find... I, I've never identified and collected as much gear. I'm so surprised they're not pushing anymore. Because sure, it makes people, like, stash tabs more, but... I loved, I loved it. Recombinator was so good. Like finally, delve identified gear were amazing. Like every, oh, just, fuck, I love recombinators. They're so good. By far the best thing to happen in the game.
Um, people becoming exceptionally powerful. And of course you see this because I then, well, I, we, we end really. up adding, you know, higher tier pinnacle bosses and we just treat the content difficulty. Um, but it does result in a situation. What they should do with recombinators, they should have a common recombinator that almost always destroys the item. And they should have a rare recombinator, which is the same as the recombinator we had that you like save up for like the really special items. I have one more. Like, mm, oh, it's hard to say, but it feels like uh, it requires, this is probably just a me to me thing as well. I wouldn't say, I'm kind of just thinking about this as we go, but it re probably requires too much uh, how do I word this? Like, it's too difficult. No, nah, that's not the right word either. I guess what I'm trying to get at is it's too hard for people, for a lot of people to get to the point where they can even now give any of this content even a go. Mm -hmm. Like, you need to effectively have a PhD in order to, or I guess this is where Build Guides and Ninja comes in. Or yeah, you just you guys give me a job in. by this complexity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but figuring out that stuff yeah. Like of your own volition is just so difficult now. And that's cool because the complexity is good. Like never mistake anything like this of me. I want less complexity. I love it. I absolutely love it. Right. And that was my whole thing back when, um, and it's just, I feel like we've created this gap where you've got like tier 16 map boss with 10 million HP. And then you've got your Uber pinnacles and I feel like the differential in just sheer life values is just outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking like 10 million HP to, uh, I mean, what are we, we're in, I mean, are we in base, like non-player scale billions now? We might even be close to that, right? Like we're certainly in the hundreds of millions. So you've got this just absolute extreme multiplier between those. And I'm just looking at it going like, well, player power is relative to monster life, monster difficulty, right? Those things are the same. Like you, you could be weaker and they could be less and you would still feel as powerful because you're just destroying them. But that would mean you're weaker than what you were yesterday. Even if the monster is proportionately weaker than they, what they were yesterday, it would still feel bad. And so there's this difficulty where you can't go backwards at all, even in that regard. Yet on the same scale, we're literally at like, you know, int max levels of life going on and levels of degen and like you, you're hitting these just walls of like, how do we even make this work anymore? Like, how do we, we can't give it more life. It's like, it and, then, the number. and then like, you can't just give it damage mitigation because obviously that affects leech and everything. So you give it a kind of like, what are you, what are you supposed to do? A hidden damage mitigation where mm. it doesn't affect all that stuff. And so you'd start getting into these weird problems that we never had to encounter before because we could just keep yeah. adding more and more power. And we have hit that point. Like there have obviously been those builds where you're playing poison and all of a sudden your damage wraps around. And so it stops dealing, you, you, you get so many poisons, it stops dealing damage. And then the damage ramps back up because it goes all the way to negative back to zero, back all the way through to positive probably, I guess, 2.1 billion damage per minute, I believe. And then at some point it was changed to be like more, uh, instead of per minute, it was per some other magnitude. And, you know, that alleviated it for a while. And then it didn't even take like three months. It probably took only another month and people are back there, you know, because they just found some new trick. And so yeah. you start getting into these weird situations where like sometimes the intention isn't to just make people... Uh, weaker. It's not. It, in fact, it's rarely to make uh, things weaker. It's to just create that little bit more space so that we can allow either more people, but not the the top top people, to become stronger, or we can add higher difficulty content without it just being absolutely like you know, like completely capped out. And you know, you could say, I say difficulty and you could say, well, more life isn't more difficult, but you know, in the same sense, like there is a correlation there. There's some softs and rages in there too. Yes. So, uh, I mean, and that's where I have to, yeah, we do have to start kind of thinking about those mechanics on that level as well. But 
I mean, ultimately, end of the day, the intention's never really to just flat out nerf things for no reason, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're we're just trying to create space if we do do it, or to have it that well, you can look at it from the other perspective of you nerf X so that a much great like so that Y, which being ten X, is now all comparatively buffed. But of course, everyone playing X feels worse and everyone feeling Y doesn't feel better. And so even though you have created a flatter, here are all these builds that are now viable and this one build is still viable but less viable and if it's a much better playing field, no one felt good about it. Mm -hmm. And well, I say no one, it's an extreme. You know, some people, a lot of the I people playing right. conversions. Yeah, I know, like but yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. speaking in lots of the general sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is what happens. And <laughs> we have created space and that's cool. And we've created more room for us to add more cool content and change things. Yet we've, we've kind of pleased as little people as possible. And that is honestly the ultimate struggle with balancing anything that are trying to find out how exactly to make people feel good, make the game feel good and do the right thing and do what we believe is the right thing as well. And it is unbelievably difficult. And I'm sure every single game company struggles with this exact, every single live service game struggles with this exact same problem. Mm -hmm. Very topical recently. Yes. <laughs> um, a tough one. So regarding the complexity a little bit, it's a good segue. One of the coolest things about Path of it. Is it good? I don't know if it's good, but you guys do own our souls once we get to maps. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys have owned my soul for like eight years now. However, I have struck like every single one of my friends, and this has been echoed by so many people uh, that has asked me to play Path of Exile. They, I've tried every single approach to get them to play the game, and I, I want everyone to play the game. And I think it's, you know, obviously it's not for everyone, but I think there's a there is a subset of folks that could love the game if we could figure out the right way to to onboard them somehow. I have a weird suggestion here, okay, which is going to like inadvertently confirm a thing that isn't even true, but okay. um, I'm going to suggest Ruthless. And I'm not saying that because I'm a big Ruthless shell, right? That's the inadvertently confirming the thing that everyone thinks. But <laughs> yeah. it's simplified enough and slower enough it's that it actually tough. works incredibly well for onboarding noobs. It doesn't. Like, I have friends who it aren't good really at games. Doesn't. And and I'm not talking about my girlfriend who loves Ruthless, just to be very clear. Um, I'm, I have friends who aren't very good at games who have not been able to get on Path of Exile in the, you know, 16 and a half years I've been working on it. They've played every single version and haven't got it very far, but it got really far in Ruthless because it's just quite a lot simpler and the combat and stuff is slower paced and the progression is a bit slower and there's less of a whole, I have to be getting that PhD while I'm playing. And then, of course, you can graduate from Ruthless to the slightly uh, more complicated version of the game that actually has, you know, 50 crafting mechanics you have to understand to make your items correct and all the stuff you have to stack. So while Ruthless was marketed as this is much over hardcore and it's so difficult and can you handle it? The reality is it's kind of Path of Exile for beginners and then the hard one is the one that requires the PhD. I can actually confirm that. One of my best friends who started playing before me, he was in closed beta, he had always got overwhelmed between me and my other friends kind of having conversations about crafting or our economic strategies midterm. And he actually very much fell in love with Ruthless and he Ideal, like, for them predominantly with new players, and the big problem with Ruthless for new players, which is overwhelming in a different way, is you just, you're just told to grind for, like, an insane amount of time to, to get anything, right? Like, at least, at least in PoE 1, yes, I, absolutely it is overwhelming. Like, that is something, like, they're right, that that is less of a problem in Ruthless, but you're overwhelmed in a different way. Like, now you're told, like, okay, well, you m might need to grind 10 to 15 hours to get an alchemy orb. But at least in the normal game, even though, yes, you are overwhelmed by loads of mechanics, but once you explain to people that they don't need to uh, understand and know every mechanic, then it becomes more digestible, right? This is something you can, like, teach as a teacher. That's why everybody follows my League Starter Guides. That's why everybody uses my videos to get people into the game, because we do that. We do explain that. So, like, yeah, I agree. Like, the Ruthless is less overwhelming in some ways, but it, it, yeah, like, I agree. Like, it just it really doesn't work for a lot of people to, like, hey, play Ruthless instead. 
because it's 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 so it's so insane. I mean, our videos prove that that's not the case, though, Scraya. What I want is the ruthless tempo with more useful drops than it has now. Yeah. Uh huh. I agree. Nice time this. He just he gets to red maps by the end of an entire league, and he's very happy. And uh, yeah, I, I totally buy that. However, I'm trying to figure out how to word this properly. Some way to even, I, I know about the, the help page and putting, mm. putting work into something that no one's using, and I, I totally buy that. But some sort of onboarding resource that's mm. not just content creators in the game. Uh, like, I just, I would love more people to be able to play. If we can solve that. Yeah, I now, know it's hard. So part of it is correct introduction of mechanics, right? Path of Exile does not do a particularly good job of onboarding you to the stuff in a slow, gradual, meaningful way, right? And we kind of, we tried our best, but it's hard. POE2 is doing a better job of that. We get the ability to, with many years of hindsight, actually have a think about how we want to onboard stuff. And an example of a thing, for example, that I know we're doing better in POE2 is there comes a point for any new player paying POE1 without assistance where they hit that thing to do with your skill gems going in the items and you want to swap an item, and that suddenly means you have to get the same socket colors somewhere else on your character. And it's that wall of like, oh, I see, I have to, okay, um, how am I going to do this? What, what currency do I have? I have three jewelers, what do they do? And you know what I mean? There's a bit of a wall there. And it even affects existing players who are trying to, you know, high-level players who are trying to swap items. So in Path of Exile 2, that problem just doesn't exist. And that means that it's significantly easier to onboard someone into both the skill system and the item system because they both just operate independently of each other and make their own separate sense. You're not stuck having to take your equipment you want to use off for another one because of sockets. And you're also not stuck having to drop a skill because you want to wear different boots with move speed. And that's helping make it more onboardable by taking this horrible wall out of the way. Hmm. Honestly, this question plagues me every day. Like, making things more approachable is, without making anything less complex, is mm. something I would love to achieve. Yeah. And I honestly don't know how to do it yeah. the right way. Um, we have a hundred... Here's my hot take on that. We don't need to. There's... I, I don't know necessarily know if you even need to try, like, in my opinion. There's, like, nearly every game is made for casual players. It's okay that some games are just more complicated. I think that's okay. We're seeing a surge now of being, like, a big demand. Keep watching. I will. But we're seeing a big surge now in more complicated games being more popular. And, and so the, there's room for both. And there's really not that many complicated games. Not if you want to make money. No, but you still can. Like, obviously, like, the, the big money value will always be in the most casual games, right? Like, what's the most grossing game of all time? Like, Candy Crush or some shit? Yeah, for you. Yeah, Polar Skate, but also, like, Dark and Darker, Tarkov. To be honest, PoE is not even complicated. It's just a lot of stuff. I have a task for you, Lisa. Give me a little write-up of how Leech works in Path of Exile. And then tell me it's just bloated and not complicated. We'll keep watching. Times in the development of PoE 2 hit things where there's such an easy change to make that would slightly reduce the depth of something compared to Path of XL1. And we feel that is a death knell of a sequel. If the players can say, you've dumbed it down, mm -hmm. then it's dead, right? No one will get behind it. And so we have made sure that not a thing has been dumbed down. Everything is as deep or deeper than the original game. And the onboarding would be so much easier to solve if we could dumb down anything. But we're not going to. That's not what we do. Okay. All right. I'm very excited to get some of my friends. They know. So my friends that uh, they've I been bouncing off. I watched a video yeah. the other day, um, <laughs> kind of what it was by, which is that uh, it the game seems more complicated than it really is. Mm -hmm. If you just play and just click, do what you're doing, you'll probably have a reasonably fun time, or well, hopefully a very fun time. <laughs> you know, um, if you start looking into what everything does and trying to and thinking you need to know it all. 
mm-hmm. then you'll overwhelm yourself very, very quickly and scare yourself. And, and then because you are now believe that unless you know these things, that you're at a disadvantage, which could or could not be true, uh, you'll probably uh, terrify yourself out of playing. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you just kind of play and just go with the flow, mm-hmm. you probably have, you should hopefully have a good time, assuming that it's the kind of game for that kind of personality or person. Yeah, the same is true for a lot of hobbies. Like, let's just wants to get into running, right? Put shoes on, go outside, done, right? But you can get into it by reading all the fitness forums and looking at the exact mile splits you've got to have and the exact cardio heart rate you've got to be in and how long you're supposed to carb load beforehand and do all this stuff. And at the end of the day, it's basically a spreadsheet. And that's overwhelming and a lot of people bail out there. But the alternative is, you know, click on the monsters or put the shoes on or whatever the analogy is, just get started and play. And it actually onboards you okay-ish. And you can worry about the carbs or part of building spreadsheet at a later time once you're more comfortable with the game. But unfortunately, life is about min-maxing these days. Everyone needs to hustle with their games. People's attention and and spare time are very limited. You know, they want their exercise to pay off immediately. They want their gaming to pay off immediately. And that means jumping right to the hardest thing, watching the hardest guide and saying, wow, this is complicated. It gets them there faster, but a more natural approach certainly gets them there probably in a more easy way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, these shoes represent like four hours of internet research. <laughs> What's the best running shoes? I totally get that. Yeah, that was actually a really cool thing. Uh, I noticed when I leveled up in PUE Mobile, when you first get introduced to the passive tree, you know, that's the, mm-hmm. the famous Path of Excel moment, um, they actually only show you the two choices. And until you select one of them, you can't zoom out and, and look at it. And I think that that, and that was a big thing that uh, I think Preach said in his mm-hmm. playthrough was there's only two choices. You know, just if you make, just understand that there's only two choices right now, uh, don't get overwhelmed. It's not that big of a deal. Stay zoomed in initially. We've experimented internally with us in Path of Exile 1 ages ago and found that when many players are presented with just choose between A and B, they say, I know there's a big passive tree. You're hiding it. What are you doing? Where is it on Google? I found it. Oh God, this is complicated. Why isn't this in the game client? You know? <laughs> And so it is tricky. It makes a lot of sense for mobile because we are targeting a wider audience there. Obviously, the game is still as deep as possible, but there are things we're doing there that we would um, be more careful before doing in Path of Exile 2, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's less of a direct comparison, I guess. Now, what would you guys say to to bring it back to philosophy in Path of Exile 1 and 2 a little bit? I actually love that uh, Neon said that he likes a lot of power, and that's obviously a concern that people play. But... uh, could we, are, should we expect a different power level initially? I mean, obviously we're very far away, um, but you know, can we get that Enigma frozen orb? Like it feels like that's kind of what we're going for in Path of Exile 1 and Path of Exile 2, are we thinking just like hammered in or what kind of, what kind of? I would say my primary restriction on power, if you want to call it that, is simply I do not want it to be that, which comes back to visual clarity. You should be able to see what is happening. You should be able to see what monsters are doing. You should be able to see what your character is doing. And it shouldn't just be, I watched a video yesterday. I don't know, maybe you showed me it. And it's just, what I was like, what what am I looking at? And it's just colors and teleporting. And that is even still kind of- That's not the egregious one. That's still kind of fine if it's very, very rare and very, very out there, but everything is just, too fast for for your brain to even be able to process what's going on. It's like one attack a second feels slow, two attacks feels better, three feels kind of good, four feels great, five, you know, it carries on. Ten, we can have a game with ten attacks a second, but four thousand somehow? Like, there has to be a line. It's like setting a speed limit at 300 kilometers an hour on the roads, right? You know, if if you've somehow built a 2,000 kilometer an hour super machine, then you're annoyed at us, but... You know, the, the average, like, gameplay will still... Like, well, just don't you want to be able to see what killed you? Don't you want to be able to, like, understand what killed you? Like, I know people are asking for death logs, but isn't that because the cause is yielding the request for that problem? And, like, that's where I believe it becomes an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I want it to be hard. I want it to you to be powerful. I want you to, it to be... I want you to be able to overcome that difficulty with gear. I want you to be able to become good at the game. I'm 100% all of that. Like, I love doing that. I mean, that's my whole thing. I want you to Hard one. be able to find ways to create builds of the week, like I did way back when. And all of a sudden now everything just feels kind of easy because you've learned all this and accomplished it. But you, I at least want it to be that you can comprehend what is even happening. 
Mark is um, in charge of this, and he is Mr. Power Fantasy in terms of wanting characters to feel good. So, like, any punchiness in Path of Exile 1 is directly because of Mark, and he is in charge of Path of Exile 2 in this way. Yeah, so like, don't get me wrong, like, the power people have is a direct resultant of A me. direct choice of you. As well. Yeah, a resultant and a choice, yes. Yeah. Um, but it is certainly the case that it is very easy to get to the point now, very easy, I should say. Again, I'm not wanting it to be impossible. But it is very easy to get to the point where you can no longer tell what's happening. It's such mm-hmm. a hard problem and to fix. I experience this a lot going back to the approachability with other people witnessing the game and they're just like, uh, what am I looking at here? I don't like it's it's just It's so hard to do something about without removing fun too. Like it's kinda of fun when visual clarity goes out the window, in a way. Like how do you have Giga, giga fun, but keep visual clarity. Like, the first time you get a headhunter effect, whether that's like, whatever the test is called, like blunderbore or whatever, like when, when things do get a little silly, that like really is a, a special moment. Constructed chaos, yeah. You want power without it feeling like it is super frantic i guess um, or like overly accelerated and that is you know hard to achieve because a good way to scale power is to scale speed right it doesn't like you could scale power only through damage and then you're just moving at the same velocity the whole time and that's nowhere near as fun of course you don't want that right so you want a bit of both but it certainly feels like the speed is at the top top end out of control and this is not for the average player the average player is nowhere near going at this i'm talking about like very 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 top end levels of of, of power power speed i don't know the, the, the words get a little bit conflated prior to exocon we're obviously aware that we're showcasing some methodical clear demonstrations of how combat works in a combinatorial way showing off all the different skills and it's not fast right like we know you know i hate i hate to say invisible monster I hate it. I hate it. I was so sad when I saw this part. Like, you know, the things that are in the uh, Alice Temple and stuff that are invisible and lurking around? I hate them. They bring no enjoyment to the game for me. The game would just infinitely be better if they didn't exist. I was so sad when I saw them. They just, they stress me out. I don't like them. It's not the type of, like, enemy I'd ever want in a game I designed. The players are going to watch it and say, but where are my zooms, right? And sure, we're showing combat in Act 3 here. You know, you're not zooming that. I don't mind when something's invisible if I can outskill it and hit it still. But when games make invisible equals immortal, I hate it. Like, sure, make it stealthy and I can still hit it. That's fine. That rewards me. I feel good as a player now. But when it's invisible and immortal, like, I see that it's there. But what, it's in a different plane of existence? Like, fuck off. I hate it at hard by act three and you certainly can be going fast if you choose to by this point if you build your character that way but we had the question of do we find some zoomy combat some insane path of exile stuff and show it at exilecon and we looked into this we started to make characters we wrote a script and the problem was because we are still the better part of a year away from release we don't want to misrepresent it where we pick a level now hastily two days before exilecon to reassure people that they're getting <coughs> the power they want and then are committed to hitting exactly that level. What if we actually wanted to be a bit higher? What if we wanted to be a bit less? And so we're going to take the time to make sure we've worked out where Path of Exile's endgame power level is at, and then showcase it with something that's actually accurate and reassuring. And we don't think players are going to be disappointed there. The last couple questions. One of my favorite things about the approach of Path of Exile that I think very, very few games actually have is the sandbox approach of we're going to throw things in that might just objectively be kind of bad right now. In two years, there's gonna be some combination of like, oh, I can run this alternate quality haste with Wilma's Requital, speaking of lack of visual clarity, that's the thing I did last league, and crazy interactions just happen. At the time of the inception of that item or that mechanic, or at the time of like a player discovering it or something happening at a league, you know, some league mechanic, how much of that would you say is intentional? Are you surprised sometimes when something doesn't show up for like a year and you're like, I can't believe players didn't find it right away? Or I, that, that's just one of my favorite things. And like, how much of that is actually intentional? We plant a lot of seeds and we wait for them to grow. And there are so many things in the game that are just bad because they haven't grown and will one day combine with something. Um, Mark, you're putting stuff in all the time. We, 
most of what get of the uh, really cool things that get discovered are not foreseen. Mm. Like to be perfectly honest, wow. there are things we add and we're like, look, some this is going to cause something, but we can't say what that something is because we don't know. But we're like, this is cool. We should add it. Like we, um, it's it's planting the seed. For those that don't know, if I remember right, righteous fire was never intended to be a standalone skill. It was supposed to be like a buff they use to buff your spells, and then. Somebody managed to make it as a standalone spell, and it was it was kind of dog shit. But they were like, "Wow, that's cool. We should like make this more of a thing." Seeds for sure, but we don't know what we, what seed we planted. It lets the community make the content later when they essentially get to make a build out of nowhere. Now the tricky thing is we can't predict where the power level of that's going to end up. And so a thing we face in Path of Exile One is we plant all these crazy seeds that combine in crazy ways, and later on they're too powerful and meta distorting, and then. A nerf is necessary or some adjustment and that's because we just put effects out there and wait for them to be combined together and we can't really predict how it's going to be having said that many of the coolest builds are using things like this you know like you know ward loop is an example where we didn't expect like if you'd said if you'd have pin marked on beforehand is it exactly what are they going to do with ward it has said something you know <laughs> something no i love i love all the discoveries and i love discovering cool, myself though. right but you know you're talking about many hundreds of thousands of people you know, getting to look at these things once it goes live versus a dozen internally or two dozen internally. It's like you're never going to find all these things. And Well, it's not even about fun detected, right? The reason usually when something is nerfed, for example, we can quickly talk about like totem, the totem build, right? That That would be the worst thing. That could stay in the game, right? I'm talking about the suicide totem, the like insane damage. Like a lot of people... I haven't read Reddit. I don't read Reddit as much as I used to anymore. But when when things like that don't go core, I bet you there's probably quite a lot of people that would say fun detected nerf incoming, right? That is objectively something that at no level should have stayed in the game for more than one league, right? Because it's so bad for everything else. Because when something is... If, if everything else is down here and Suicide Totem is up here, then that takes away. That actively takes away from all the different fun things down here, right? People were really okay with that on Reddit, they knew it was too obscene. Okay, I mean, it's too extreme extreme an example, but like, it's it's always, you know, scary to leave things like that in for too long. You can't have two crazy outliers. And that's fine. That's the beauty of Path of X. That is, exactly. I, and it's really cool. I love it, yeah. right? Like, and we're directly inspired by Magic the Gathering there. They print some <laughs> weird cards occasionally and then wait. You know, Helm of Obedience is a perfect example, but I won't go into the analogy in too deep a way. <laughs> and I loved used to trying to hunt the broken mechanics and the things that interact, and I loved trying to find things that people hadn't done before. And like when I originally was like, I'm talking way back when, like before I even worked here, a good over a decade ago, that was just that was one of the things that made me love Path of Exile the most. You basically, so. got hired by a build of the week, right? Thank you, left it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, because you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> so now you run the game. <laughs> That's actually so, yeah. a perfect segue to my final question. Uh, what is your guys' favorite builds of all time? It's a dumb answer because it, it just, it, but it's just so core to my past of this game. And it's not even a complex build, but it was just my silly freeze mining that got me a bunch of hate from a bunch of people and a bunch of, you know, it was. The old freeze mine prolif. It's not like there was any complexity. You literally use freeze mine with prolif, and you just freeze normal rarity monsters with the proliferating freeze, and it would freeze every boss. So you always just pull, you pull random like white mobs next to the unique monster, and you just freeze them, and then you just have someone unequip all the AOE and just single target down the boss. You know, like it. Um, it was borderline exploitative from an outsider perspective, but it was kind of like, well, I mean, look, that's how it works. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> You know, it wasn't bugged, it wasn't anything, and then it caused all kinds of uh, kind of ethical debates about whether or not I should be doing that, and uh, as a staff member, I'm promoting exploitation, because I was playing with people on stream quite frequently back then. Neat up. Um, so it, even though the build isn't like some crazy thing I discovered, no one was doing it because Freeze Mind dealt no damage. No one used it. Like, it was deemed worthless. And then I was like, well... I mean, is it? And now, much like <laughs> you have an Aura Guardian running, or a, you know, a, a Aura Bot running, and all the high-end efficient parties right now, back then you'd have your Freeze Miner, 
because you're, you're probably just running a two link freeze mine and pro lift. You don't even need the other gems, and you know it's just it it holds a special place. You know, even though nothing complicated about it whatsoever, it was just this thing of a, a worthless skill being now deemed exploitable. And then we have to nerf freeze mine. Like no one would have ever had thought of that being a thing. In like those words would not have been put together before that time. So. Well, we were just talking about nerfing cast on death over the weekend. So. Yeah, well, sure. Again? Yes. All right. <laughs> hey, did you hear about that interaction, though? No. So during uh, the Trial of the Ancestors League, um, if you die, die. In the match. In the match, you don't actually die. Because oh, because of the totem. You come back to life. Yeah. Like that whole kind of cooldown. So you can you just, just run over and death, it. On death and then you respawn. Yeah. Why not? It becomes completely so you can something, just something nuke them. Up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And it's just like all of a sudden now another just you know support gem that has very very niche use cases. You're like, well, actually this this you know creates some more inspiration as to how it can be used in real interesting ways. It's real cool. It's uh, even when Andrew said that on stage the other day, I was like, oh, yo, I like that. I really. It's very Catholic. Finally, it's huge. Yeah, it's cool. Um, this is going to be a really boring answer, okay. but my favorite build that I have played is a really vanilla Molten Strike Dragonaut that oh. I put together myself a long time ago where I waded into the monsters and Molten Strike them to death and it felt good and it felt like I was actually hitting them and they died and I found, found good items and it was in hardcore and I didn't die and it just was a good experience, you know, and that's the one that I, I preferred over net decking with other people's build guides where I just follow it. Like, my most powerful character would have been a recent Righteous Fire one. Cool. Mm. The credit goes to the people that put that together, right? Um, I just liked my Marauder because he was working well and I was killing monsters and melee felt good for me there and I had the right attack speed to feel good and, you know, had a good time. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. This, it's this been was, great. This was more than I could ask for. This was great. Thanks for the good question. <laughs> it's a really good interview. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I guess that concludes our interview. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Awesome. All right. That's it. That was the interview. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you everyone for, you know, helping to grow this community and get us down there. It was really good. I'll link it in chat as well. Make sure you go check out subscri uh, Subtract Him. Subscribe. Sub subscribe to Subtract Him um really really good you did a great job there um yeah i don't know i was initially very against the split i think it's definitely like the way to go splitting the aims i think yeah no it's it's an interesting future we walk into i'm surprised they didn't touch on gold that much there but yeah we'll uh we'll end it there hope you guys enjoyed watching the reaction and uh watching it with me on youtube subtracting did a really good job there and uh We'll, we'll watch other videos too. A lot to watch, a lot to catch up on. Yeah. Thanks for watching. So if you liked the video, make sure you check out Subtractum as well. And more importantly, try to die less than I do.